<clears throat> we'll begin. Are we ready to go with the um, live stream, ladies? Yes, we are. Okay, awesome. Welcome everybody to the Regulatory and Compliance Committee meeting. I'm just going to open our hui with our karakia. Whakatakate ho ki te uru, whakatakate ho ki te tonga. Kia mā, kina kina ki uta, kia mā, taratara ki tai. E hi akiana te atakura, he teo, he huka, he hohunga, haumie, huie, tai ki e. Now, the apologies and declarations of interest. Um, so, the only apologies that I've had are from our CEO and Councillor Dave Collard. I move that our apologies for Councillor Collard be received and accepted, please. Happy to second, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councillor Smith. And I'm not taking any deputations today because nobody's asked me for any. Um, so we'll, following on from our um, item 5.3, there will be an update on an issue that members of the public and um, elected members have raised on parking enforcement on state highways and um, Dean will take get Grove Shelter to take us through that after that, after the annual shelters update. So let's kick off with the item 4.1, is that right? Yes? Correct. That the Regulatory Compliance Committee confirms the minutes of the meeting of the committee held 30th of July 2020 are a true and correct record. Do I have a mover? Yes, I will. Thank you, um, Kelly. Adele. <laughs> Thank you, Adele. Happy to second. And all those in favour, or were there any matters arising? Okay. I'll I'll do the um, appropriate manner of virtual moving and seconding. Sorry. So I'm um, I vote yes because we're in a virtual world. We have to go through all this. I for me. Thank you. Aye for me. That was Councillor Porch. And is Councillor Vucic here? Yes, aye for me. Thank you. And Member Ward? Yes, aye, Kelly. Thank you. And we had Rachel and Adele as the mover and seconders. Thank you. Done. Councillor Stratford, Councillor Clendon's also sitting there. He oh, he is here. Unmuted and then mute and then he's unmuted. Councillor Clendon, we're just moving the minutes from the last regulatory and compliance meeting. Yes, I get that. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Okay, now we move on to the first of one of our information reports, which is the update on building compliance. So I'll move the recommendation that the Regulatory Compliance Committee receive the report, building compliance update report. I'll second, Madam Chair. Thank you. And Brent, did you have a, did you wish to speak to this report before I take any questions from members? Through you, Madam, Dr. Ch Dean. Madam Chair, I'm all happy to move straight to questions of at least the committee. I think if you all the information's in the report, it's pretty. I don't have any flash slides like I do for the BCA. We haven't quite got to that uh, level of detail yet with our BI system for the TA functions. But yeah, happy happy to take any questions. <laughs> Thank Madam you, Madam Chair. Chair just, 
Sorry, Madam Chair, for, just for the committee's uh, information, uh, when Trent refers to TA functions and BCA, the BCA looks after the building uh, consenting side of things. And compliance, building compliance, uh, sits to the side. It's it's a standalone component, I guess, of what we do as a TA. There is some crossover between the two, uh, and, and Trent will take the opportunity after questions uh, to also just briefly update on our preparation for the BCA audit, which comes up next month. <coughs> Thanks, Dean. Yeah. And just a reminder to elected members, if you would like to ask a question, can you please pop it in the chat? I don't, um, I'm on my iPad, so I won't see a hands up function. Um, so I've got Rachel up first. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Trent, thank you for this report. I had a question um, around dangerous building notices, and I've got in the back of my mind. I think it was our first regulatory compliance committee meeting. You talked about the move of your team into a more can-do approach, and that's always really um, filled me with so much hope and confidence. It really got me quite excited. So my question is actually around dangerous building notices. I note that there's a significant... Well, actually, I don't know if it's significant or not, but there is a portion of um, revenue from notices issued. And I'm wondering if because we are experiencing a significant number of people building dwellings without the required consents, whether there was an opportunity to invest some of that fund into an education campaign around what people can and can't do, especially taking into account the change of regulations to 30 square metres and things? Yeah, look, so... Uh... I'm not too sure about repurposing the funding, um, but we are aware of the changes and there's good guidance from MB, which we're making available on our website. I actually have an update that we're waiting to be put on the website now, um, which it's pretty thorough. Like MB really has, it's way more thorough than the last set of guidance we had on exemptions. So you'd, you'd struggle to get it wrong, to be honest. And even if you were, I mean, we're always available for a chat. You know, the, the one thing I say to everyone, ring us. We're happy to have a chat about it and, and put you on the right path rather than be the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff. Thank you. Next, I have Councillor Clendon. Yeah, I'm sorry, Madam Chair, I can't quite hear that. Uh, excuse me, Councillor Clendon, your uh, connection is really um, challenged. Are you able to pop it in the chat? Sorry. He's typing. Will's on mute. Okay, whilst um, Councillor Clendon is um, having communication difficulties, I want to take Member Ward's question, please. Thank you. Thanks, Madam Chair. Yeah, I just had a couple of questions. Um, one you may or may not be able to answer, but just looking at the um, the revenue received from prosecution, what is the average cost of, of prosecuting an individual? Ooh, I don't have that information available. I'm sorry. I could look into it for you and update you at the next meeting, but, yeah, definitely don't have that on hand. Okay, that's fine. I just wondered how whether it was financially viable to even bother prosecuting. Um, and secondly, the request for service. Um, one issue that we do have at board level with requests for service, and it's been ongoing over the years, is um, when they are closed, are they actually resolved? It might sound a little bit of a, a contrary question, but um, compared the number of... Um, RFSs that you receive compared to those that are actually closed, what we find yep. is they, um, since um, Council did away with our action sheets, which we're trying to, to reintroduce, um, we found that a lot of RFSs actually dropped off as closed um, and they were never actually fully resolved. Um, just, just some sort of reassurance around how that's actually monitored. How can I... I, I guess the 
best way to give some context and confidence to you in, in, in that arena is when I was head of the um, the TA and the, the compliance team, we found that that was the case with a lot of the RFSs. You know, you were you were pretty laden with the amount of RFSs that were coming in. The, and, and to be honest, look, the investigation into those RFSs was a bit haphazard. Um, what we did introduce while we while I was there, and it's still current now, Jeremy uses it all the time, is a Gen BCA. Now, no, sorry, not BCA, a Gen compliance, which is a, it's like a folder where you put an investigation in. Now, what we found when we started using this is it gave you the ability to actually record everything that was going on when you investigated an RFS. So you actually come to a resolution, you know, and then when, because quite often you talk about resolution of an RFS, sometimes what council's able to do about it isn't actually the resolution that the person's looking for. So therefore, um, it can be perceived as being unresolved when in fact, it's as resolved as we can make it. So what we found by using this system is we had less repeat RFSs for the same thing. So, you know, I'd like to say I'm pretty confident that when we say we've closed something, it's closed and we've done the best we can with it. Okay, thanks. That's, that's a good answer. Yeah, so there is some way of measuring um, using that, that gene compliance. That's great. Thank you. No worries. Thank you, Member Ward. Uh, Dr Dean, did you have something you wish to comment on? Yes, on Madam Chair, uh, I asked for a comment. I now have about three comments to make, if I may. <laughs> yeah. um, just on the, the cost of prosecutions question, um, it, it's variable. Uh, I think the important thing to remember here, here is, yes, there is a cost, but the customer is the citizen out there who is paying rates and is behaving lawfully. For those who are building unlawfully and getting away with it, um, there's a cost to the rate payer through us having to apply a compliance approach to that. And I know there'd be many structures out there across the district that are unlawful and non-compliant right now. Uh, so from a customer service perspective, we are serving the residents and ratepayers of this district by approaching things in a graduated fashion. We follow the VAID model, voluntary, assisted, directed, and enforced. Uh, so we, it is a graduated approach. We don't go to prosecution and that form of enforcement as a first step. We do uh, work with people um, in those instances where we have, <coughs> excuse me, where we have prosecuted and been successful. They have been people who have been seriously non-compliant and just have not been prepared to work with council to get their structures uh, to, a, to a state of compliance. So, um, yes, there's a cost, but I think it's also something that the public in general and ratepayers and residents look to us to do. Uh, it's part of our role as regulators to do that. The other, um, I forget what the other point is now. I made notes while, while others were talking. Um, if I may, I'll come back. Um, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Clendon's question was uh, regarding the swimming pool numbers. Uh, a third of swimming pool inspections failed. And um, yeah, I had that written down as well as a concern. But I, I do note that it says, you know, it's in line with other um, territorial authorities. What happens to those who aren't, um, who have a failed spa or swimming pool on their um, property? Madam Chair, so they issued usually issued with a notice to fix to um, identify the breach, and then they're given a time period to sort it out. And I guess to ask um, Councillor Clendon's the why question. Mm -hmm. Look, it's a number of things really, and and you know I. It, I don't like to say this, but in the past, it's it's probably the skill set of the inspector is maybe not as high as it should be, um, and from from the past, from councillors in the past or council in the past. Um, what we have now is we have Jeremy running the team who's come from Auckland. They're very diligent on it. He has a very high skill set when it comes to to swimming pools. And look, I, I believe we're getting better at our job. 
you know that that's the thing. We are we are very stringent. We've had a, a change in legislation. Also, the swimming pools instead of being under the Swimming Pools Act, it's now under F9, I believe. I'm pretty sure that's correct. So it's a building code clause now for um, compliance with swimming pools. And you know sometimes things change. You can get a, a tree will grow next to a to a um, to a swimming pool fence that was planted as a small shrub, it's, that will make it non-compliant. So it can be little issues like that. Um, someone could have done some landscaping, moved the fence, they haven't put it back, those kinds of issues. Thanks for that. And finally, um, look, were there any other questions? No, no other questions, but I have one final question. Um, some elected members and members of the public have raised concerns about the wait times for inspections on their houses across the district. Yep. And I know that you um, did a presentation and this was raised at our last uh, regulatory and compliance committee meeting. Um, can you give us an update today? Like, is, is there a disparity yep, between wait times up north versus down here? Look, I, I guess it's always tough to answer those kind of questions because the data I have, I mean, I think the last, when we updated last, 24 hours out, you could get an inspection in all areas at 24 hours. I had my team leader just yesterday give me an update. I'll just quickly find that for you. In Kaitaia. That was as of yesterday. So I, I guess on that, I'm pretty happy with that. Sorry, I think that's a pretty please, good. Can you please repeat that? You cut out in the first few seconds of what you said. Okay, no worries. I can do that. What I might try and do is if I can see if I can type it into the um, type it into the message in Teams, so we can all read it. How fast do you type? There we go. You can all see that. <laughs> okay, so we've got Kitty Kitty two days, Kawa Kawa one day, Kai Kui two days, and Kaitaia one day. Correct. That seems pretty, pretty right to me. I'm um, I'm pretty pretty happy with that. To be honest, I think that's a pretty fair whack. We've had a few. We've got a staff member in Kaitaia off at the moment. He's injured himself, so we've brought in a replacement for him. So yeah, look, it's it's always a balancing act between having a whole heap of inspectors there. Um, a little while ago, we actually had a bit of a lull inspections. Funny enough. Um, oh, things yeah. are things are dropped off. So I, I guess it's nice to get specifics because sometimes it can just be someone having a whinge they weren't happy about something. You know, with specifics, I can do something with that and check if there is an actual delay. Thank you for that, Trent. Um, I do have a question from Rachel, but uh, Dr. Dean, did you want to go first? Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Just a comment and back to swimming pools, if I may. Um, I was last week. I was out with Jeremy visiting a site where, and no names mentioned, but where a particular gentleman had an issue with his swimming pool fencing, and is battling council on this matter. Um, I have to say that with the change in legislation, and when we wear regu our regulation or regulators hat, um, we're always mindful of passing the front page of the Herald test. If a child drowns in a swimming pool. Council will, won't look good. The questions will be asked about us not doing our job as regulators. So we uh, we work with people to achieve compliance. Uh, Trent mentioned that we've issued notices to fix uh, on a graduated scale. The next uh, step after notices to fix uh, would be infringement, and then we would go to prosecution. So on a regular basis, we work with George Swanepoel. And in this instance, it is across this case um, because this is someone who is very well known to council, and um, we obviously approach things in an even-handed fashion. We don't make any exceptions, regardless. Uh, but this person is quite adamant that he is right and council is wrong in this instance. So we approach these things carefully. We take advice from a legal point of view. And we believe that uh, compliance should be achieved in this instance, uh, and we, we are exploring options to um, 
to work to continue working with this person so that um, compliance is achieved. But if a drowning would be most unfortunate, and for those cases that aren't compliant, Jeremy is chasing those hard uh, to make sure that pool owners understand their obligations. Thank you. Um, so Rachel's withdrawn her question, and Your Worship, the Mayor, did you wish to? say something yes i did uh, just okay. following uh, thank you dean for that um comment and i'm not sure whether it's um the one you raise is the issue that i've been involved in but i suspect it may be around the swimming pool um but what i did because this person just so everybody knows is will um, still not so be just remember that we're live streamed. Yeah, will not be satisfied. I've recommended that they actually approach the ombudsman in this particular case because the alternative is that they take legal proceedings, which are costly, or we do, one or the other. And um, I do think it's one of those situations where uh, very rarely, but occasionally we'll get a case like this particular one where um, there are other issues. And um, so I, th I think it's probably sensible that if the, he wishes to take that course of action, just so he knows. In the main, I think um, I get I get very very few complaints about our inspection of pools. In fact, I can only remember two as me, quite honestly. Very good. Madam Chair, the Ombudsman, the Mayor's point about the Ombudsman is a very good one. Um, in addition, we also have the option now that the legislation falls under the Building Act for applicants to go to MB for a determination. It's a low cost uh, um, option. It's $300 and they can approach MB for a determination. What that does is it achieves an independent assessment of whether council was right or wrong. That's right. Excellent. Uh, cool. And so that's always an option. Yep, very helpful. Thank you very much. So uh, at this stage, We've moved and I think seconded this report. Um, unless there's anything further anybody wants to raise, we're going to do that voting. Uh, excuse me, Madam Chair. Yes. Um, what I would like to do is just give a brief update, very short, on our um, audit readiness. Yes, please. So what, what we are, obviously, we've got an audit coming up, and I think it's they start on the 23rd of October from memory, um, remotely, and then they'll be here for the following week after Labor Weekend. Look, so we are we're flat out at the moment, carrying out audits and um, crossing the I's and dotting the. Um, crossing the T's and dotting the I's rather. And what we are getting back from our internal audits that we're carrying out is we're actually looking very good. We're only finding small little um, minor discrepancies that we have to sort out. So we're busy doing those. And our confidence is growing that we should do really well in this audit. Yep, my confidence is growing as well. Thank you. I feel really... Um like excited that we've got a handle on this and we're getting a handle on the um, resource consents as well. It's wonderful. Thank you very much, Trent and Maggie and that team. Cool. Sorry, Malema. I'm all over the place. So, can we... Oh, yep. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Clendon, just to receive this report. Is he still there? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Um, we'll take that as a vote for receiving the report then. Yep. Councillor Court. Thank you, Madam Chair. In favour. Thank you. Councillor Smith. In favour. Councillor Research. Yeah, in favour. Sorry about that. I've got birds singing in the background. <laughs> Member Ward. <laughs> yes, in favour. Thanks. Thank you. And Member Gardner. Yes, in favour. Thank you. Awesome. So let's move along to receiving. And I know that there may be some confusion because we had a, a dog control um, report on our last agenda, but that was the one from the year before. This is this year's report. So the recommendation is that the Regulatory Compliance Committee receives the annual report on dog control policy and practices 2019-2020. Can I have a mover, please? I'll move, Madam Chair. Thank you. Yeah, I'll second it. Thank you, Thank gentlemen. You. And 
Uh, Rochelle, did you want to talk to us at all about this before I open it up to questions? Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I will share my screen if I can. I do have some slides. Awesome. Uh, if you can let me know when everyone can see those. Yep, I can see that. Thank Great. You. Okay. Um, so, yes, I trust everyone's had the opportunity to read uh, this latest annual report. It does come hot on the heels of, of the last one, uh, but this one is for the 219 to 20 year. Um, and this is a requirement of the Dog Control Act again, um, where all territorial authorities have to report annually uh, to the Department of Internal Affairs on, on specific areas um, of the legislation. So this information assists central government to assess national trends and developments. So this is just a slide to summarise the report. Um, there has been 1,908 dog control customer requests for service um, over the last uh, period. And this is 257 less uh, requests for service than the previous year. Uh, I would put this decrease <clears throat> is in part to less RFS received over the lockdown period um, than we would most likely get. And there's also proactive work that's been going on in the community, obviously, with desexing programs and um, working with dog owners around their responsibilities in turn does reduce those RFS numbers. Uh, the dog registration uh, numbers, the, the known dogs in the district remain steady, and of those, we have 8,284 registered for that period. Um, we... The uh, registration and compliance action plans uh, were delayed a little due to the COVID lockdown period where some proactive work couldn't be done. So that's not um, a figure that we sort of were aiming towards, um, but the proactive registration program is, is getting underway now that our registration period for this season has finished, and so we certainly want to up those numbers. There continues to be only one disqualified owner in the district, and we have no probationary owners. Uh, a total of 166 infringements issued. Um, this is down, uh, which is again reflective of the less RFSs that have been received, and also uh, the lack of continuation of proactive work in regards to registration. And there were five prosecutions for dog attacks over the, over the past year. There's 237 menacing dogs in the district, and 201 of those are for breed, um, and that is the American Pit Bull Terrier type of dog, um, and one classified dangerous dog in the district. Um, something that we are very proud of is that over 30% of impounded dogs were rehomed to rescue groups um, or adopted via the council website. Uh, this is just a, a great um, post of somebody who was very happy with the dog that they received. Um, this is uh, something that we really want to explore some further opportunities in the coming year to make the um, Far North District Animal Shelters a point of contact for people who are wanting to um, get a new dog um, and increasing our adoption rates to get the best outcomes. Thank you, Rochelle. I don't know if you've disappeared or whether you were finished. Oh, no, I'm still here. I've finished. Oh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, first up, we have um, your worship, the mayor. First question. Uh, thank you. It's not so much a question, just a comment. Um, uh, I'm not sure whether this is quite the right time or place, so excuse me if I don't get this quite right, but um, just so everybody knows, we've received our funding for the Southern Kennels through the PGF grant. So I think I copied you into an email, Kelly, about that. Oh, yes. That, sorry. Um, Rochelle's going to go into that. In the oh, next, sorry. I beg your pardon. Next. All right. That's why I, sure, I wasn't sure. I beg your pardon. I'm, and the other so thing is that I've been asked I've been asked to be a referee for the Bay of Islands Watchdog Group. They've put in an application in for... 
some sort of prize, and uh, they've asked me to referee, so I'm, we're, I'm very pleased to do. I think they do a good job with us too. The Bay Violence Animal Rescue? Yes, and that's, yep, that's right. Yep. And, um, Woohoo! Yeah, it's good. I, I wish them all the very best. I was actually the only uh, who asked me to act as a referee for them, so which I'm happy to okay. do. Okay. Well, maybe it is the watchdogs. Um, just follow myself following on from uh, what you just said, um, yeah, the Bay Violence Animal Rescue do such an awesome job um, keeping our pound numbers down. I know a lot of people go straight to summer through their face, you know, through the Facebook page when they want to um, report a dog. Um, I know that the SPCA are struggling up here in assisting as well when when people need to report animal abuse to the SPCA. So Bay Violence Animal Rescue are, you know, filling the need. And I hope that we'll continue to keep working with them. Um, and they do a lot of education out in the communities as well. And um, it was wonderful to hear that Tehiku um, Community Board granted Donna Doolittle a substantial amount of funding for the expansion of that operation in Tehiku, um, which is a separate entity from Bay Islands Animal Rescue. And it, it would be awesome if we could, um, you know, do something similar to that for the uh, Kaikui Hokianga uh, Bay Islands Whangaroa area um, with regards to Bay Islands Animal Rescue, who are doing a lot for. Um, animals, not just dogs, in our area. Sorry to monopolise the time. Um, <laughs> what have we got? I saw a comment from Anne. Did I? No. Just get back into here. Madam Chair, yes, obviously, um, if we put them on our website, they're available nationwide. I noticed that the, um, the post on the screen at the moment is from the Taranaki. I'm just wondering, is this normal, common? Do we actively promote the dogs out of the district? It, this looks like a really good success story. Success story. So I'm just a bit curious to get some more information. <coughs> Rochelle? Uh, through the chair. Um, this is actually um, from Hamilton. Uh, this, this dog went through, um, yeah, it says... Uh, we live in the tr Tron. <laughs> um, so if, like you said, if, if they go onto the website, then they are, um, you know, nationwide. Um, and there is interest, um, you know, from all parts of the country if they're after a particular dog or if they do just want to rescue a particular dog um, and it suits their family. Um, it's always really important to, to pick the right home for a dog and it's not necessarily... Um, you know, if there is interest outside and, and no interest within the community, um, you know, it's really looking at the best outcome for the dog. Um, so we certainly, you know, if, if people are willing to travel the distance um, and there's dogs that, that fit into that family, then, you know, we would uh, certainly look at that. Um, it's, it's an exception probably uh, coming, coming this distance. Thanks, Rochelle. Any other questions on this report? Okay. Um, let's um, receive it officially then before we move on to the next part. So um, Marlema needs controls back of the presentation. Can you stop sharing your screen? Thank you, Michelle. <laughs> So we had, um, I think the mayor, I can't remember. And me, Madam Chair. Yes, that's right. Okay, so receiving this report. <laughs> Councillor Kingdon. Aye. Councillor Court. Thank you, Madam Chair. In favour. Thank you. Councillor Smith. In favour. Councillor Vesich, oh, I've already got you. Member Ward. Uh, yes, in favour, thank you. Member Gardner. In favour, thank you. And me. Thank you. 
Okay, so item 5.3, that the Regulatory Compliance Committee received the report Animal Shelter Projects Update. Do I have a mover and a seconder, please? Yes, I'll move. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Member Gardner. Happy to second. Councillor Smith. Thank, Thank you. you. And uh, Rochelle, did you want to go back to your slides before I take questions on this report? Thank you. Um, yes, I can. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Okay, Rochelle, the floor is yours. Looks like me having an internet. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I trust everyone has has written the rep uh, read the report. Sorry, um, this report is really um, providing an update to the committee on progress and, and future thinking for the animal shelters in the district, um, making sure that um, our facilities um, going forward meet the health and safety for the staff that work there, but also providing the needs um, of the welfare needs for the animals that that come into our care. And, and also the community's requirements um, moving forward. Um, the Far North has planned for the building and upgrade of two shelters in the district for some time, um, and those will be in Kaitaia and Kaikohi. Uh, and as his worship, the Mayor uh, referred to before, there has been uh, recently an extra $1 million for animal shelter projects um, through the Provincial Development Unit, um, and this this has been able to um, enable us to explore further opportunities to increase our levels of service, um, and, and hopefully change the perception of the community towards council-run uh, shelters. So I have got a few photos um, that we can sort of go through. Um, this is the design. Uh, for the Kaitaia Northern Animal Shelter, um, which has been planned for a significant period of time. And the uh, the budget was approved at council meeting back in uh, December. Um, however, with post-lockdown quotes, it, there, there was an indication of a shortfall in the budget. And the additional funding now has provided us an opportunity to award a contract and progress our plans for the Southern Shelter. Uh, KPH construction um, in Kaitaia has, was the sole tender of the project and uh, we're hopeful to have an approval for a um, recommendation to award that contract um, at the Infrastructure and Committee meeting tomorrow. Um, all going well, we would be able to uh, start work on the shelter uh, later this month. Um, it'll be a facility that the public can use uh, for a complete end-to-end -end process um, for all animal management uh, matters, uh, making payments, impounding, microchipping, and having dogs return to them. Uh, this is a picture of the current facility um, in Kaitaia, so, um, which is, is very small and was built uh, back in 1988. Um, if I move on now, unless there's any questions in regards to that, I could, I could work through all the shelters, uh, Madam Chair, and then have questions at the end. Yeah, I like the sound of that. Thank you. So this is um, a photo of um, Malka Kennels, which is um, in Napoi Road in Kaikoi. It was purchased by council earlier this year, um, settlement right in the middle of um, well, the beginning of COVID at the end of March. Um, <clears throat> it was identified um, on purchase that there was um, refurbishments and improvements that needed to be made before it would meet um, the council's need for an animal shelter. Uh, keeping in mind um, the animals that do come into animal shelters through um, uh, animal management offices are a lot different than what a boarding uh, facility would would have. So unfortunately, a lot of the dogs that come through are um, not very socialised with other dogs um, or other people and um, not used to that, that confinement. So the uh, 
animal welfare codes of practice as well for temporary housing of, of um, companion animals and also for dogs certainly do set um, a lot of requirements around uh, what is needed. And a lot of the dogs that do come into our care haven't been on uh, leads or anything like that. So um, they're not um, able to be uh, kept in a, a temporary facility like um, normal boarding ones can. So you can see from this picture here that, uh, you know, the ability for dogs to see each other, which would be aggressive. And, um, and also many of the dogs that come into our care haven't been fully vaccinated. So the uh, the spread of diseases such as parvovirus and things like that are, are very, um, very high. Um, and so we must have... Um, areas which can be sanitised and uh, using parvicide and things like that, such as um, impermeable concrete and things like that. So um, that's the reason why there was uh, the need for refurbishment. Uh, the the netting that is used on on the shelter as well, um, you'll find that a lot of dogs uh, that come into um, a shelter environment um, will bite at this, this netting and actually pull themselves out. So it needed to be a lot more secure. Um, and also around the security of the actual site, um, one, to keep dogs in, but also to um, keep people out um, and, and lighting and things like that. So there was a need for, for quite a bit. Um, the budget that was allocated to the project to do the initial refurbishment um, the estimated cost of delivering the, the scope that we required um, did have an estimated shortfall of around 400000 just to, to bring it up to, to what we needed. So the additional funding received um, now provides us an opportunity to, to explore different options uh, for, this, uh, for a southern shelter. Um, in early thinking, sees this funding, uh, we could sort of facilitate the kenneling for 10 dogs using the um, basis of the design for Kaitaia. Um, in addition, uh, sort of having more of a facility for rehoming dogs and an education facility for the people, um, whereby if they have, um, you know, it could, could facilitate puppy training um, and adoption area, areas for match-ups, enrichment yards for, for dogs that do spend uh, long long term with us, and also an area whereby it's, it's safe for staff to, to sort of work uh, aggressive dogs. Um, and, and it's also a, a place that the public can come through and meet with the animal management officers if they are having um, issues with with their dogs. Um, so these are just another um, couple of slides of, of Malka Shelter as it is at the moment. Um, so in order for us to... Um, look at uh, what we would like to do, you know, the, the thinking perhaps uh, for a southern shelter, um, you know, there may be a need to explore um, removing the house from the site and using the whole site. Um, so there's there's a lot of different options there that we can do um, and uh, that would also have a, a vehicle wash down and all of those sorts of things. So the um, outbuildings here as well could be could be moved off so that we could accommodate um, some of the future thinking that we have for a southern shelter. Hauraki is um, currently used as our temporary shelter. Um, and despite not currently having a resource consent, it remains our preferred location in, in the short term for housing of our current dogs. Um, it meets the welfare needs of the, the dogs and, and the health and safety of our staff um, to, to work them. Currently, the Kaitaia facility is also used as backup, um, especially since um, the gorge has, has been closed. So it, it enables um, people that are looking, you know, to get their dogs returned to them from Kaitaia, the less travel um, for, for short term. Um, as a result of the delays uh, due from COVID and, and getting Kaitaia and, and Horaki um, up and running, uh, we are looking to get a re re 
retrospective resource consent for the um, far north district um, for Horaki Shelter uh, to get that reactivated. And we'll be having further conversations with neighbouring farmers um, to sort of update them on once we've got those pre-application uh, meetings underway. We're certainly uh, looking at deconstruction of the Horaki Shelter once Kaitai is up and running, which we hope will be within a sort of a six month period, um, all going well and we don't go into any further lockdown. And the materials from the shelter uh, certainly will be able to be used uh, for future route, uh, use at um, the southern shelter. That's that's all on that one, Kelly. Thank you. Thanks, Rochelle. Sorry, I thought I was on mute and you would have heard the um, recycling truck in the background and the dogs barking. My apologies, everybody. Um, do I have any questions from the committee members? No. Oh, yes. Council of Usage, fire away. Thank you, um, uh, Councillor, the, what, my, it's more of an observation and, and something that I think we need to be looking at more closely, and that is um, I'm all for this, uh, the pound uh, to be sorted out in the southern and the Kaitaia, and I'm real pleased that we got some funding that's coming through. But I note that in our original budget for the Ka uh, Northern Shelter was 1.1 million, and a 10% contingency now it's 1.4. So we've gone over budget, and also note with the southern uh, shelter uh, that we're looking at 200k. And I remember thinking, this is a great opportunity we've got at the time. Let's let's go go for it, and hopefully we can get things done quickly. Turns out it's actually um, original scope has changed, and now it's 600,000 over budget by 400,000. Um, and of course, we're looking at now Horaki being continued, even though it's non-compliant, and there are delays. So. The issue here is not, I'm sure there's some very good, good, good reasons for it, uh, but I just wonder why we seem to miss the um, budgets uh, so much in a number of areas, not just this. And I'd like to see us tight, tight, tighten up our initial budgeting and also getting things done on time. Thank you. Thank you, Madam the Research. I think your questions might be best placed for the infrastructure. Sorry, Infrastructure Network Committee tomorrow on order, um, pricing. Point of order, Madam Chair. Councillor Court. Yeah, point of order. Um, I was very conscious during Rochelle's presentation that her notes are visible at the bottom of the screen, and this is being live streamed. And until such time as contracts are awarded, budgets are confidential. So I'm just a little bit anxious that uh, we do not discuss money or make money visible to the public until such time as we've gone to market and awarded contracts. Thank you, Councillor Court. Uh, Dr Dean, you had your hand up. Uh, Madam Chair, along the same lines, uh, tomorrow clearly is a separate um, committee consideration of the awarding of a contract. Um, today's update is uh, really to advise you as the Regulatory and Compliance Committee of some of the thinking, uh, particularly around the Southern Shelter. Uh, we're very fortunate to have um, Provincial Growth Unit funding to supplement the Council budget. It offers us uh, opportunities that we wouldn't otherwise have had. But what we'd like to do is to come to the next committee with uh, specific um, options and recommendations uh, for your consideration around the Southern Shelter. Um, Councillor Vucic make, makes a good point. Um, uh, I think we'll all celebrate when these shelters have been built. I certainly will be. Um, the discussion has been ongoing ever since I joined Council. And if I may remind um, councillors that um, we started with a budget of 250,000 to build um, one shelter, and that was never going to be enough funding to do that. And then we had, in the more recent discussions, we had estimates from quantity surveyors um, for two shelters that were larger shelters, but 
in the order of uh, $6 million for two shelters. And that was clearly unaffordable and was, was not going to happen. So we've been back to the drawing board several times. So when, when these shelters are built and when the contracts are awarded to do the work, um, I, I think we will reach uh, a milestone um, in, in this council's um, history where we will have created two new facilities that will serve the, um, the public very well. So uh, the point I want to make is that next at the next committee meeting, we'd like to present the options for the Southern Shelter because we believe there are several. Um, and um, part of that is a consideration for council of the asset that we acquired from Top Energy um, for building a shelter at NAFA. And we did get that piece of land at a very good price. So we'd like to package all of this up and uh, and offer that in a, as a set of recommendations to you uh, for your consideration at the next committee. Thank you very much, Dr. Myberg. That's, that's awesome. And just on that point of order, I need to just remind everybody that this information is in the agenda report, page 35, and in the interest of um, transparency and the, the fact that it's a sole, sole um, tender and we're in negotiation, I, you know, I don't, I didn't have any problems with the figures being in the report, and uh, Council of Research has has just repeated the numbers that are within this publicly available report. Um, so if there are no further questions, right, we're going to um, move to receive this report. Are we moved and seconded, Malina? Madam Chair, regarding the point of order, I do accept that they're in the report and I do accept your ruling. I do think this matter needs to be referred to the Chief Executive. I have concerns that the matter is in the agenda and it is in the public arena ahead of an in-committee item in tomorrow's agenda. Cool. Um, how do you want to proceed? Do you want to take that up with him yourself or do you want me to? I accept that the chairperson's ruling is final in these matters, so I leave it at your discretion. Okay. Dean, perhaps you and I can sit down with Sean just to check the process around this, this matter. Certainly will, Madam Chair. Um, okay. We awesome. can talk, talk, talk about that offline. Yeah. Yep. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, where am I? Point five, point three. Did we have a mover and a seconder? I'm sure we did. Yes, we did. there was a mover and a yes, seconder. We did. Just, Thank you, yep. Casey. Can you just pulling up the up? minutes? Yep. Awesome. One moment. Thank you, Madam Chair. All the division. We've just had a bit of an electric surge here, so we're just pulling things up, if you don't mind, your, um, Madam Chair. We'll be patient. Uh, Rochelle, thank you for your report, and I loved seeing the photos in there. I think that any members of the public concerned with, you know, animal welfare, getting some greater insight into what's happening in the pounds uh, will have enjoyed those pictures as well. Thank you. Thank you. So we just need the division. Okay. There we go. Oh, didn't work. Okay, did who who moved and seconded? I cannot remember. It seems a lifetime ago. Uh, Member Gardner and myself, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank awesome. you. Okay, so I'm for. 
your worship the man? Councillor Kingdon? Yes, support. Thank you. Councillor Court? Thank you, Madam Chair, in favour. Councillor Vesich? Aye. Member Ward? Yes, support. We lost the Mayor? Must have. Right. We will I beg your pardon, a... I was on oh. you. Yes, I'm in <laughs> favour. Thank you very much. All right, so that includes our final item on the agenda, but I did ask uh, for an update on a parking issue, and um, Dr Dean, you organised for somebody to give us an update on... So we have an issue with enforcement on state highways by our parking warden, and this has gone on for about 18 months, trying to sort out authorities and... Really? Yeah. Madam Chair, if I may, um, Rochelle will present some slides on this. Um, there are two issues here. One is our bylaw for enforcement on state highways, uh, or the extent to which the bylaw covers that. And the other is delegations from the NZTA in order for us to be able to do that. It has required quite a bit of follow-up with the NZTA and some delays, I might say, but we've now got an update which allows us to um, share with you what, what that might look like. Um, and we'd like to, at a future date, also report more extensively on uh, how we enforce um, across the district. We, we are very stretched in our resourcing uh, in this regard. So if we add to the workload, we need to consider also how we achieve the, um, the cover, the coverage across the district. I might share with you that yesterday was a most, un a most unfortunate incident happened. Our parking warden was threatened with a knife. Someone pulled a knife on him while he was doing his job. Uh, it's the third incident. This happened in Kerry Kerry, and it's the third incident in the space of 10 to 15 days. So we are quite concerned that we're seeing a lot of aggressive behaviour going on from the public, um, and we need to look after our staff. So we are taking measures, um, body camera being one of those. We're taking steps to ensure that, that our staff are protected. Um, it's becoming a dangerous job. So I'll just share that with you, um, and, and I'll hand to Ms. Uh, Rochelle to share her screen. Um, she has a bit of an update for you about the detail of the NZTA and our bylaw and how those will work or could work together. Thank you. Thank you. Is my screen shared? We can see it, Rochelle. Thank you. Great. Yes, Thank good. you. Um, so apologies for the delay in, in the update on parking enforcement on State Highway. I do um, appreciate that it has been an ongoing, um, and I have managed to uh, recently in the last couple of weeks have a meeting with the NZTA um, Northland manager as well as their, their legal representatives. Um, so the NZTA does have sole powers of control for all um, state highways uh, within the country, <clears throat> but they are able to delegate some of these powers to council, and, and one of those is um, parking enforcement. Other ones that um, are for consideration are things uh, such as stock control um, on the state highways. Uh, there's also um, cars for sale on, on state highways, um, those sorts of things, and, and being able to sort of enforce for the NZTA. Um, and the fees that come uh, from stationary vehicle offences, if, if the delegation is, is um, given to the territorial authority, uh, the council involved is entitled to keep the fees for those offences. Um, 
so the next steps around uh, there, there is a delegations instrument, um, and it's really for council to decide what, if any, of of the delegations within that instrument um, are, are required, and and to which areas of the state highway uh, that they they wish to sort of um, have the, that enforcement done. Um, so so currently, you know, parking enforcement is done in Kitty Kitty uh, Pai here. Uh, Kaitaia, whereas um, if we could do state highways, then we could look at the whole district um, or, you know, geographical um, parts of, of the district. Um, so that would open enforcement up to the likes of uh, Kaikohi, um, Murewa, Kawakawa, um, and, and, and throughout the district wherever parking enforcement is um, needed. Um, so council and the transport agency can sign off the delegation. The one thing at the moment is that our, our bylaw um, does cover all of state highways. So it, it's not uh, going to mean a an amendment or that we need to wait for the review of the bylaw. Our bylaw currently states that um, it is applied to um, all roads within the district, including state highways, whereas some councils' bylaws only um, enforce on council-controlled roads. Uh, so, so really all that we need is in order to uh, have that delegation signed um, and have consultation with um, the, the police commissioner as well as the NZTA. Um, as Dean did point out, uh, we would need to have the resource of parking wardens to enforce, um, and that's obviously, uh, you know, increasing the area that we do have uh, to enforce, but as well as ensuring that our safety of um, the wardens are, are met. So any extra enforcement will, will require further resources in order to, to meet that. So those are really the next steps on, on what decisions uh, need to be made in order to get enforcement on state highways and, and whereabouts. Uh, any comments on that? Elected members, do you have any questions? I'm sure Belinda has one. <laughs> oh, here we go. Rachel, you're up first. Go for it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Dean and Rochelle, for this presentation. Um, as I'm sure all other elected members are incredibly concerned to hear that um, our parking warden has been put in such awful situations. He's an incredibly kind man, and um, not that anybody ever deserves that kind of behaviour directed towards him, but that really does concern me at a governance level as to what this means going forward. So really appreciate the opportunity to have this conversation. I guess my question is whether or not this is an opportunity to have a broader conversation about what innovation we may be able to use in this space, what parking looks like, across the district, especially in alignment with our transportation strategies and um, things like that. So I recognise that there is a short-term conversation to this situation, but my question is also about the opportunities for our committee and other committees to be having a broader long-term conversation at the same time. Madam Chair, if I may comment, absolutely. I, we heard last week at the workshop that was held with councillors um, about road safety, and the NZTA, uh, NTA uh, shared some information, particularly about vehicle safety as part of their model. It's only one component, but um, other councils, for example, do um, expired WAFs and licences as part of their parking warden duties, and it's an opportunity that I believe we should look at as well, and we'll, we'll uh, incorporate that into a future report to uh, this committee um, to consider whether we'd like to do that, because um, it, it does offer opportunities to expand our, our capability across the district. We are stretched currently, and we are seeing these changes in, in the behaviour from the public, um, particularly those who are non-compliant and, and believe they can do what they like. Um, 
So I, if we could bring a report with, with options, because certainly there are um, bigger issues, and we want to work with organisations like REAP and our colleagues in the NTA to make sure that we have an integrated and aligned approach to not just parking, but um, um, safety, vehicle safety and road safety in the broader scheme of things, because I think there are some, some clear connections between what we heard last week and the topic that we have here today. So we'd like to bring that back to you for some um, for your consideration. Fantastic. Thank you, Dr. Myberg. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thanks, Councillor Smith. And I do have next member ward. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just a couple of questions, really. Um, with regard to the delegations, where does State Highway 11 from Kaukaua to, um, through to Pukatona Junction sit in relation to the MOU between NZTA and Council? That's my first question, in relation to um, policing the bylaws on that State Highway 11. Uh, through the Chair. Um, sorry, just to cl clarify, the MOU um, is my understanding at the moment that it only um, is around the maintenance of the state highways and, and not the parking enforcement of those state highways. Okay, thank you. Um, and, and so I guess the other the other issue is um, with these delegations would be, um, particularly through Kawakawa and uh, the Paihi area, would be consistency. Um, if monitoring and ticketing is going to be done, you know, on the on the seaward side and through the township, um, we do have areas that um, that council are instructed not to ticket or enforce along those areas. Um, in portions of it that are blocked off over the summer periods, for example, outside the Maritime Building, and it's not actually advertised road closures or anything, and um, those areas are not ticketed. So I think if, if we're going to have, um, you know, some sort of um, enforceable bylaw, we need to have consistency and, and fairness within the towns um, and ticketing where there, there is pressure on the parking. Um, and I'm really sorry to hear about our warden. That's extremely disturbing. Thank you, Member Ward. Um, did anybody wish to comment further? Okay, well, I'm... Madam Chair, oh, sorry. Yes, yes, Rachel. I, I do note, um, and I don't know this off the top of my head, but I have... I, is this bylaw up for review in coming months? Is that correct, Dean? Do you know? Um, <clears throat> Rochelle can add, add, correct me if I've got this wrong, but the, um, the advice we've had from the team looking at the bylaws is that this is a current bylaw and it does extend in its wording to the possibility of state highways. Uh, what we do need is both, though. We need the bylaw plus the uh, delegation from the NZTA, uh, uh, yeah, from the NZTA to make this work. Um, and it's probably uh, on that basis um, it, it would allow us, the, the, the bylaw would allow us to enforce, but we do need the delegations. Mm -hmm. Madam Chair, just looking for a bit of clarity as to what direction our committee need to give here. Oh, I am not on mute again. Um, I I need to check my work stream program because I I'm pretty sure that there is a parking report coming later in the year. Um, do you? Dr. Dean, do you uh, think that yeah, we'll, Madam Chair, we'll be able to catch all that? If I may, um, we, we can report out of cycle, um, even if it means bringing that forward in the work program to a, a, a next meeting of, of the committee. Um, Rochelle will need to advise on, on the process for the delegations. I don't believe that we are um, that it, that's an extensive period of time. I think we can do that in, in, in short succession and then uh, potentially report to the next next committee. Oh, my gosh. That's awesome. Woohoo! 
Well, Rochelle needs to confirm that, Madam Chair. I don't want to set her up for <laughs> failure here, yeah, but... Um... <laughs> if I may, Madam Chair, um, it, is, it is relatively... Um, we've got the documents in order to, um, you know, receive those delegations. It's really, you know, the decision to be made around uh, what delegations um, we would like and um, whether or not there is any... Um, geographical areas that we want or whether or not um, we go uh, for the for the full full district um, not you know having the full district is, is probably what I recommend not necessarily having to enforce every single area mm. of that that state highway it, it obviously has to have in a, a a limit to to parking or rules around the parking in the first place so um, it's it's a document that's that's already there and you know the the bylaw as it is 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 current and because it does capture uh state highways within it um it does not look as though it needs to be an amendment at, at all um that bylaw is current and it, it is under review um will we'll be under review shortly okay thank you rochelle so it sounds like it's going to be on our next um agenda um bar yeah everything going to plan. Um, I've got uh, Councillor Clendon wants to make a comment, please. Yeah, thank you. Just referencing back to the issue of whether we should be um, ticketing for expired warrants and regos, I very strongly believe we should be um, monitoring warrants of fitness expiry date. I'm less concerned about registration, which is central government tax gathering largely, but warrants of fitness are about the safety of cars on the road. And I really think that's something we should progress and give our wardens the authority to issue tickets where warrants are not being displayed correctly. If I may comment, Madam Chair, um, we, we certainly, if, 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 it, if the council agreed to going down that path, um, and that's for your consideration at another time, we would still follow the VAID model, which means that we would gently remind people that they need to comply, and they still have 28 days uh, to do that. And, and, and so it's not a revenue gathering exercise, and for us raking in the the revenue only in those instances where they clearly you know have 28 days and still don't comply. So we we would follow a graduated process as we do now. Um, if if that if those additional uh, functions and duties were added into the mix. Okay, um, I'm going to add that to my list to catch up with you offline about Dean, and I'll talk to Councillor Clendon about it further. Um, so, I'm sorry. I think that Member Ward had another question. Yes, thanks, Madam Chair. Um, just a point of clarification, I'm a little bit confused here. Um, with regard to the existing state highways and the bylaws, am I hearing that they're currently not actually enforceable under Council's delegations? Uh, through the Chair, um, that's right. We do need delegation from NZTA in order to do stationary vehicle offences. Um, the, the current MOU is, is, does not capture um, parking enforcement at all. It is based around the maintenance um, of the state highways. So all the, um, all, all the signage, the limited parking we have up at the moment is, is actually pointless because it's not enforceable. That's bizarre. Um, and, and we've just, through our board workshop, just recently at community board level, um, Kaio have actually identified that they're beginning to have a um, not just a seasonal car parking issue on their state highway, but actually an ongoing parking issue on their state highway. So um, we need to sort of perhaps look outside those, what we consider those main busy centres as well as the, as the far north district grows. So, um, yes, I'm interested in following up on this one. Thank you. Thanks, Belinda. Yes, that's why I um, wanted to, you know, why I pursued this as a, um, it's really important, especially um, from a disability action group point of view. We've got a number of mobility parking spaces that are always, um, you know, it's got inappropriate vehicles parked in there. And our poor, um, you know, people with a disability or just, you know, elderly uh, 
just forced to park miles away. It's terrible. Anyway, I think it's time to close this meeting. And once we've closed, I need you all to stay on, please, because we um, have, have something else further. So um, I'll do a closing karakia. And I've, I'm going to do a shorter one, Malima, because I, I keep tripping up on this one. There's one line that I keep getting wrong, uh, but I'm going to practice it over the next month. Okay. Kia tau, tō rangi marie, ki runga i ngā iwi o te ao. Let your peace reign on all the people of the world. Amen. And that's the end of our hui. Can I please have confidence?